Um, my name is Blake Clocky, and today I'll be talking about our reintroduction trials for two species of Panamanian harlequin frogs uh, threatened by amphibian chytrid fungus. And Allopus are very well known in the conservation community just because of their susceptibility to chytrid. In Central America, when chytrid arrived at Monte Verde and caused the extinction of the golden toad, it also caused the extirpation of Allopus varius there. And as this wave of chytrid headed southeast through Costa Rica and into Panama, caused declines in Allopus senex and Allopus varius. And as it reached uh, Western Panama, it was pretty clear that uh, something had to be done. And that's where the Panama Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Project came in and um, captive populations of Allopus varius, Allopus atakai, which also exists in quite a few zoos in the US, Allopus cerdis, Allopus limosis, and glyphus were established. Um, and these species are housed at two facilities in Panama now uh, at the Gamboa Arc and at the El Valle Arc. And unfortunately, Allopus chiriquiensis uh, is, hasn't been seen since 1996, and it's presumed to be extinct. Um, uh, if you guys can see my cursor, I'll be talking about Allopus limosis today. And uh, we're right about this location and Allopus varius is right over here. So with these Allopus declines, um, Allopus limosis can still be found uh, in pretty, uh, the sites that we're working are pretty low elevation, so it's a bit warmer there. Um, and there's this idea of the climatic refuge where uh, perhaps it's just warm enough where uh, the Allopus can live and the chytrid uh, doesn't do so well. So these are possibly ideal locations to conduct the reintroductions. Um, and the Allopus various population that I'll be talking about is really close to the coast here. So it's a uh, very low land uh, rainforest. Um, and yeah, this is what we're trying to prevent. So uh, here's some Allopus chiriquiensis uh, in the Smithsonian's collection. So uh, unfortunately, the species is thought to be extinct now. So um, in captivity at the Panama Amphibian Rescue and Conservation Project, we are breeding uh, Allopus, uh, the five species there. Um, the captive husbandry is pretty simple after we figured it out and rearing the offspring. So what do you do with the offspring when they can lay several hundred eggs and you have all these metamorphs and then they turn into juveniles and uh, suddenly you run out, of, you start running out of space in the ex situ uh, collection to house all these animals. Um, if they don't, mean, don't need to be genetically represented. Uh, you have the surplus offspring. So this is what we're working with in these reintroduction trials, just the surplus Allopus limosis and Allopus varius. Uh, so our goals are pretty basic here. We've never done any reintroduction with uh, Allopus before. Me, myself, well, myself, I'm pretty new to uh, the field of reintroduction biology. So uh, there's a lot of pretty big learning curve for us. And we just really want to figure out the basics. So uh, what methods are effective for post-release monitoring? Uh, how do frogs interact with the environment and the existing amphibian community? Uh, for example, chytrid is still in the area um, at decently high prevalences. For example, at one of our field sites, it stays around about 20% um, in the amphibian community. So. When you have these highly susceptible amphibians going back in, are they just going to get infected with chytrid right away and die? Uh, will they increase chytrid prevalence in the community by shedding zoospores? And just how far will these animals travel? Um, what kind of habitat will they seek out? And we also want to figure out what influences post-release survivorship. Uh, so we have a pretty common colubrid snake here, uh, Eurytholampa. Erythro lamp, lampris epinephalus. Um, and this was less than 24 hours after reintroduction, we were tracking this uh, adult female, Allopus limosis, and we found the snake instead. Uh, we weren't really sure what to do, so we, we temporarily brought the snake back to camp. And on the way back to camp, it uh, regurgitated this, this frog that we had released with a radio transmitter on it. 
Um, so our methods are pretty standard uh, throughout these different reintroduction trials. So when we prepare the frogs, we use markers um, on this photo on the right, that green marker is just visible implant elastomer. Uh, during the first release, we also tried visible implant alpha tags. It's left here. Uh, and that takes us E45, if you can read it, which if those alpha tags worked, uh, it would have been very nice because they're quick and easy to use. But um, it was mentioned in another presentation that these, these tags are not very reliable. And we found that to be the case too. They, uh, migrate under the skin and they, they will flip over and on the back side of the tag there's actually no marking at all so uh, they it, perhaps it would be a viable method if there is a, a marking on both sides but uh, we, we stopped using them after the first reintroduction trial. We take ventral and dorsal photos for identification so uh, the allopus hell have unique markings, um, so it's pretty easy to to tell them apart. Uh, this is ideally we want to avoid this with uh, when we had larger sample sizes for reintroductions because uh, it's a tedious process, as other presentations have described, sorting through the photos and trying to uh, ID the frog by by markings, but. Um, it's fairly easy when you have smaller sample sizes, so I don't be afraid to use this method. Um, and here are just a couple of Allopus limosis males, and you can see it's pretty distinct markings, and uh, their dorsal coloration is a bit more tricky to tell apart, but overall it's very, very doable. We take a, we measure the weight, SBL, and take a pre-release Kittred swab, uh, which is always negative because we don't have BD in uh, the facility. Um, so just have that baseline uh, disease level before reintroducing. For monitoring, um, we've used radio transmitters, which are from Hollow Hill. Uh, they're 0.31 grams, so they're pretty lightweight. They have a battery life of, uh, it says 13 to 22 days. So we kind of took an average of that. And we'd say that the, the transmitters have reliable battery life of day 18. Um, so if we were doing uh, prolonged monitoring beyond 18 days, we would just collect the frog at day 18 and equip it with a new transmitter uh, to prevent the transmitter from dying in the field. Um, and not being able to locate the frog. Although that did happen a couple times where say the transmitter would uh, lose its battery on barely life, battery life on day 16 or 17. Um, but we were able to just visually search in the area for the frog where it was last located and uh, find it and equip it with a new transmitter. And we use a one millimeter silicone tubing belt. Um, as the attachment mechanism for the frogs. Uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, it takes some getting used to definitely to get uh, the belt, the perfect amount of tightness on the frog, not too tight, not too loose. Uh, if it's too loose, the transmitter can rotate to the underside, the ventral side of the animal. Um, and this did happen a couple times and it, it, then the transmitter is uh, coming in direct contact with the skin down there, and it will cause uh, some rubbing, abrasions. Um, so it's just this kind of, uh, as Luke was talking about, figuring out these methods, training everybody, figuring out just the perfect fit for the frog. Um, and we got this idea as reviewing some papers. I know Jody, Jody Rowley used it for some tree frogs. Um, and I had met Andreas Pasaconis one time and I emailed him and got a ton of information from him. And he has all these different harnesses that he's trialed with uh, dendrobatted frogs um, and also some toads. And uh, talking to him, got some really good advice. Um, he's done little loop the belt with like leg loops to keep the transmitter from shifting to the underside. Um, he's done several different harnesses and just just ways to mount these. Um, but we found with Adelopus that 
this was a pretty reliable and simple method. Uh, we tried with leg loops and uh, antelopes tend to walk quite a bit and it was just a bit disruptive in how they would sit um, and move about. So this was a, probably the simplest method for us. Um, our first two reintroduction trials, we did mark and recapture and all three we used soft release enclosures um, at one point and then post-release chytrid swabbing uh, was uh, a huge well emphasis for these trials since uh, allopus are very susceptible to chytrid i just wanted to talk about the transmitter a bit more um, so we use the hollow hill lb2x uh, when we were talking to hollow hill uh, john there he sent us a few uh, non-functional transmitters to trial, and our frogs, Allopus limosus, are quite small. Um, the females are about three and a half to four grams, um, and the males were actually too small to equip with uh, radio transmitters. Uh, we use the general rule that um, the body weight of the, the, the transmitters could be no more than the body weight of like uh, 10 to 15 percent of the frog um, and we didn't really observe any I guess hindrance to their movement or anything like this they, they seem to handle the transmitter quite well but uh, here's the LB2X and you can see on the frog is uh, you know you wouldn't want to put this next size one up on uh, on the animal it'd probably be too big and I have this photo on the slide because it's it's on my title slide and it's actually uh, probably one of the first frogs we equipped in the field and it's just a it's a very good example of how not to attach these these belts um, so you can see uh, with the one millimeter tubing we use just a uh, normal cloth thread and we tested it in a terrarium this belt mechanism it'd take about uh, three weeks for the cloth thread to deteriorate and just for the belt to come off the animal. So it worked quite well. Um, but this uh, this knot right here will cause some abrasion. So um, just, you know, tying a smaller knot and then pushing that knot into the silicone tubing so it wasn't touching the body of the frog. That just, that itself was uh, something that we had to figure out in these trials. Um, these transmitters are also activated with by two uh, leads that come out of the body of the transmitter. So the transmitters are waterproof, but these leads, uh, they're, they're a bit hazardous to the animal. Uh, they can come in contact with the animal and they're metal. Um, and if it does flip over to the underside, that will cause uh, abrasions on the animal, animal very quickly. So. Uh, once we figured that out, we removed the transmitters and we actually covered them in just a clear coat of epoxy, uh, which created a smooth surface. So if it did come in contact with animals, it, it didn't cause as much harm. And then um, it also helped waterproof the units a bit more. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sharing these details with you because uh, these these were absolutely critical for our trials and. Uh, it's small things like this that really have to be considered when uh, setting up these reintroductions and testing all your methods uh, before you get on the field. It's pretty important. So our soft release enclosures uh, were quite large, uh, like a 0.8 meter square. Uh, we filled them with leaf litter and plants and the holes in them were large enough for prey items, uh, insects to pass through. So we actually didn't um, have any supplemental feeding for the soft release enclosures. Uh, the, and the frogs didn't really lose weight, any more weight or weight any faster than uh, the hard release frogs or the radio telemetry frogs. Um, and these soft release enclosures are pretty nice because you can put like your hobo data loggers in there for recording humidity and temperature uh, without fear of them getting taken out in a rainstorm or like a feral dog coming and grabbing it and running away. So uh, these these enclosures worked quite well. They were uh, lightweight and we could roll them up and transport them to different field sites uh, pretty easily, um, obviously disinfecting them between field sites. 
So I'm going to talk about three di different reintroduction trials. And our first one was with the Lamosa harlequin frog, Alopus lamosus. Our second was with Alopus varius. And our third, we returned back to Alopus lamosus. And I'm just going to talk through kind of what we did, what we learned, um, and kind of this ad adaptive management strategy uh, that we tried to work through and figure out how we could collect as much data as possible and apply the lessons that we learned from each trial to the next trial and, you know, keep on improving for uh, future reintroductions. So our first release, we just wanted to know if uh, radio tracking was a viable method for locating Alopus post-release. Um, you know, it's pretty expensive. These transmitters, they're about $180 each. Uh, you can send them in to get refurbished for about $70 after their battery life is expired. Um, and for this first trial, we uh, attempted to track the frogs for the lifetime of, of three three transmitters, so uh, 52 days about about that. And it's it's quite expensive if you think about it. So uh, if uh, is are are the radio transmitters going to provide enough data and get enough data that it will be worth the cost per animal uh, in this reintroduction? We also wanted to know if there is a difference between survivorship in hard and soft release frogs. So um, the soft release frogs actually came from a project that was going on right before we arrived. Uh, Angie Estrada and Daniel uh, Medina. They were doing a microbiome experiment with uh, the soft release enclosures for 30 days and monitoring how Alopus lamosus skin microbiome changes in these mesochasms um, from captivity to the wild. So we took advantage of that and essentially after they were done with their experiment, uh, we used animals from that had been in their mesochasm for 30 days and we released them as our, our soft release animals. Um, and we wanted to know how long does it take for frogs to become infected with chytrid or, you know, if chytrid is the primary threat to them, will they uh, die to other things? And uh, can we reliably recapture frogs without radio transmitters? So uh, one of the big ifs was if we release animals without radio transmitters uh, for just a general mark and recapture study, will we be able to locate them again uh, and collect enough data to make it worthwhile? So I just have a couple of videos. I, I hope these turn out okay. Um, I, 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 my, my internet should be fast enough. I'm not sure if the Zoom And this is just, there's a Lamosa harlequin frog with a radio transmitter where, where, where my mouse is circling in this ball of roots. Um, so the value of radio transmitters is kind of just demonstrated right there, especially in the tropical rainforest where uh, the terrain is pretty rough, there's lots of vegetation, um, and a visual encounter survey along the stream bank where this was, I think this frog likely would have been passed over uh, and then you're missing out on, you know, one recapture, BD swabbing, a weight of the animal. Um, and we were also able to observe some very interesting behavior on this first release. Uh, so I woke up one morning, it was raining very heavily and uh, the stream had flooded and there is, this is about a week and a half into the release trial. And there was one female that uh, she stayed on this little debris pile in the middle of the stream. Uh, so I thought for sure that she would be gone as the, the, the water level rose in the stream. And this is the debris pile right here. And she uh, she's right there on some uh, branches overhanging the stream. So she climbed up these branches that were uh, connected to the de debris pile in some way. 
and she climbed about four feet above the stream, uh, which was pretty interesting because uh, these frogs, you know, they were raised in captivity. Uh, they've never seen a torrential downpour in their life. Um, and to know that uh, instinctively they knew how to, to, to go above the rising water level was pretty interesting. Uh, and the radio and transmitter really didn't seem to uh, affect that movement. And yeah, here's another photo of her uh, just hanging out on this, this branch. And overall, I think radio transmitting was very effective. Um, this was actually one of the uh, frogs that made it to around day 50. And this was just a couple of days before she was released uh, from the transmitter and set on her set on her way and you can notice she has a very healthy weight um it's active uh not not really anything that i can tell that was wrong with this animal or um harmed by the transfer in any way so uh with our radio tracking sorry i i, sh I should go back here a minute so uh we had the 30 soft release frogs right and then we had 60 uh hard release frogs and we had eight 16 of them that had radio transmitters equipped and then the rest of the animals were uh just released hard re released as mark and recapture um surveys so uh with the 16 animals that we were radio tracking we had 371 recaptures uh, over the 52 day period and uh, this map is generated in the CTMMR package, uh, continuous time modeling. And um, if you imagine the stream just going right through the middle here, we were pretty surprised because when we released the animals, uh, they didn't really travel away from the stream very far. Uh, most of them found suitable habitat within 10 to 15 meters of the stream bank, a very riparian habitat and uh, they just kind of stayed stationary. And uh, we were kind of surprised by this because uh, what's known about female Adelopis is that they don't really hang around the stream much. And we, we thought they were gonna head off into uh, the rainforest more, but each of these hotspots is pretty much a different frog um, or a couple of them that were just next to each other. And uh, they're, they're area that they stayed in was not very large and you could almost go back to the same area and with the radio receiver on and just get the signal of the frog and then start this visual survey and be able to find the animal day after day. Uh, there were some occasions where uh, frogs moved farther distances. Uh, for example, these dots are one female frog that traveled over 150 meters through the rainforest over just a period of three days. Um, and it was raining very heavily during that time, so we think uh, that 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 precipitation may have drove her to go to higher elevation. And there was another female that traveled up here, and another one that was over here too. But generally, uh, most of the frogs that we were radio tracking uh, were just in riparian stream habitat, right about where they were released, and they they seemed to do fine there. Our average search time was uh, six minutes and nine seconds per animal. Uh, so radio tracking uh, Alopus, I would say, is very effective. This is very quick. Um, and when you're working with a, a large number of animals, being able to locate them quickly makes your workflow a bit easier, especially on the days where you have a bit more to do. So once a week, we swabbed and weighed the frogs. and. Uh, that's that's definitely a bit more time consuming because you you're sterilizing everything between frogs, uh, labeling swabs, and uh, everything like that. So it's just a bit more a bit more tedious, but um, it's 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 super quick and effective. I would say there were some occasions where uh, yes, it would take 30 minutes or an hour or sometimes two hours to find uh, a frog, but these were kind of rare occasions where um, perhaps they had gone up a, hill, up a hill and the signal was bouncing very weird or it had gone in a hole um, or something like that. But generally, it, it was very quick to, to find these, these frogs. 
uh, when we found them, we recorded what the substrate they were on and if they were visible or not. So 63% uh, of the time, these, these individuals were just uh, exposed. And I was a bit curious about this because um, we know in captivity that these, these animals lose their toxicity. So uh, in the wild, if these animals are just, you know, exposed, um, you know, they obviously don't know that they're, they're non-toxic, but uh, their predators may be able to detect her in some way, or they just might be more susceptible to predation because they don't have that toxicity. Um, and if they're not hiding, the predation rates could be higher than, you know, what we generally expect. So we released 16 frogs with radio transmitters. Um, sorry, yeah, I meant to say earlier that uh, eight of them were hard release frogs and eight of them were uh, frogs from the soft release trial. Um, so we had an even split and uh, we were just really curious if there was any difference between the hard and soft release. And this is one way by equipping them with radio transmitters to figure that out. So uh, we had four frogs that survived to 52 days with radio tracking and these radio transmitters were removed um, just after day 52 and the frogs were let go. We had two that were removed from the radio tracking study and later released. So it was around day like 37 to 40 where uh, these two animals developed some abrasions uh, because of the radio transmitter. So uh, just looking at these animals every day, making sure they're all right. Um, and then uh, if you see any damage to the skin, it's probably best to remove them. So we, we took these back, these two back to camp and we treated them with uh, some antibacterial cream, SSDS, and then uh, released them at the end of the study. And I came back about a month after um, we left the field just to do a quick visual survey. Uh, and I, I did find one of these animals. So um, if you do have, you know, a situation where an animal gets injured or uh, the skin abrasion and you treat the animal and allow it some time to heal. It's, it's not all doom and gloom for the individual. We had four transmitters failed. Um, it's just, it's really difficult to say what happened to them. Uh, it's, it's probably humidity related. It could have been just a short battery life on the units. Um, but if these, I would say likely it was probably humidity or the frogs going through water. Um, the transmitters are waterproof, but uh, the, the tropical rainforest is pretty harsh on them. So, I mean, it, it could also be other things where perhaps a, a bird just carried them off and it was outside of our search area and we could no longer detect a signal at all. But uh, generally when this happened, uh, it was kind of obvious and you could tell sometimes that the transmitter was dying because it would give in an irregular, irregular signal uh, like sometimes it would be just like a constant buzz or like a fast ping and uh, if we you know observed any of that we'd just swap out the transmitter with a new one because we knew uh, that one was going to fail pretty shortly. We had four animals that were confirmed lost to predation um, and primary culprit was was arachnids. So there there are some fishing spiders that are quite large in the stream, probably like four to five inch um, or so. And yeah, there was one time where I found one eating the frog and whip scorpions too. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things out there that will eat the frogs. And two died to other causes causes other than predation. Um, so the one of them was caught up in some vegetation, uh, likely due to the radio transmitter. And we were actually searching for this frog and it started downpouring very hard. And when it's downpouring, it becomes very difficult to do radio telemetry. So we headed back to camp and we came back after the rainstorm and uh, this this frog had, uh, it, it, was, it was dead and it, Looks like the belt may have got it caught in vegetation. So that's just something to be aware of if you're doing radio telemetry to you know, locate these animals often and you know 
make sure there's no issues with them. We didn't really observe any differential survival between the soft and hard release, release animals that were radiotracked. Um, in fact, the, the hard release frogs lived a bit longer. Well, li sur had a higher survivorship. Um, it seems like the soft release frogs, it really just allowed them a month extra time of uh, BD exposure, uh, well, chytrid exposure for them to pick it up. So, yeah, um, and our mark and recapture survey, uh, it was a big learning lesson here. We considered it a bit of a failure. Uh, we had 30 recaptures total, and this uh, includes just like not in incidental encounters while we were radio tracking the frogs, which is most of our, our time spent. Uh, we found very few frogs during the actual uh, visual encounter surveys for for the mark and recaptures. Most of them were doing radio telemetry to find the animals. Um, we only located 15 individuals um, and of those 30, uh, like seven, seven were the same female that we encountered. So uh, we want to adapt our methods for future introduction trials to, to kind of fix that mark and recapture study. Um, so the really interesting thing was to be able to attract these animals after release and uh, swab them every week and you know see if they are picking up BD or not. And we have five different individuals here and they're all labeled this T and these are all individuals that were in the soft release enclosures. So um, none of our hard release animals that we're radio tracking actually picked up chytrid in the study. So it really seemed like a disadvantage of the soft release enclosure was just allowing extra time for disease exposure. Um, and where these lines end, say here early, and this is, this is early and these are early. So these animals uh, died or its signal was lost. And uh, it seems likely that if these animals are infected with BD, uh, and so for load increases that perhaps uh, they're not behaving normally or they may be more susceptible to uh, predation if they're not moving as quickly. Um, and we also uh, swab the amphibian community uh, before release and after release. Um, so there actually wasn't many amphibians in the stream that we did the release at. Uh, Pre-release, we had a sample size of 29, which is uh, pretty low, but uh, the prevalence of chytrid was 24%, and a lot of it was in Colostethus panamensis, which is a very common frog in the stream, the Panamanian rocket frog. And uh, when we swabbed it after, uh, when we were done radio tracking, prevalence was a bit higher. Our sample size was 49, but um, it's, still not very different. It's really hard to say that uh, the, the allope has increased prevalence or not. I think this would require larger sample sizes in the future and you know a bit more uh, replication uh, to really tell, but um, generally this is the evidence that we have that you know we're reintroducing this frog that's very susceptible to chytrid in the stream where it is present. Um, and it's, it's challenging when you think about the long-term establishment of the species or that sort of thing. So with our second release trial, we really want to apply the lessons that we learned from Allopus lamosus to Allopus varius. Uh, and uh, we, we want to know if we increase the number of individuals released and modifying the transect placement will it result in like a higher mark and recapture rate over a six month period. So we are extending our mark and recapture uh, study by, you know, uh, several months, three to four months and putting some more effort in there. And we want to know just increasing the sam sample size, well, the number of individuals released substantially, will we actually be able to collect uh, data that is, is useful in some case? Uh, and can we learn more about tracking more frogs for a shorter period of time? So instead of investing three transmitters into each individual, uh, could we just put 
radio transmitters on, you know, 28 frogs and track them for the period of uh, one transmitter lifetime? Will we be able to collect a lot more data um, on those individuals during those this first critical days? And uh, just really, what what will that show us? And we also tried uh, radio tracking some frogs in Amplexus. We had a three few pairs that were in Amplexus with the radio transmitter, and we wanted to see if you know they would they would spawn in the stream, um, which they did not. And what are the temperatures of these frogs in the environment? So we had a, a little thermal camera, and we did take some photos um, when it was possible to see you know if these frogs, if, do they have elevated temperatures from their surroundings? Perhaps they're basking or something like that. Uh, they are at a low elevation site, so it is a bit warmer, but trying to just start to pull apart that uh, perhaps disease refuge hypothesis and you know see what data we can collect, what we can learn um, from it. So here's one of the Atlopus various equipped with the radio transmitter, similar style to last time. So we released 461 frogs. Uh, we had much more available. So uh, these frogs were uh, originally bred at uh, EVAC, Elvi Amphibian Conservation Center, and uh, they were uh, split between EVAC and Gamboa. Um, and we had these surplus of frogs. So we were talking to Heidi and uh, we decided that this would be, you know, a good good use of these animals um, to try to learn a bit more. Um, unfortunately, the frogs bolted after release. Uh, so we learned uh, that Allopus varius is perhaps a little more uh, stress vulnerable than Allopus limosus when it comes to transport. Uh, we transported these frogs to the field site and they were held there for a couple of days in temporary enclosures um, before we before release. And uh, we had a few individuals that uh, died before release just because of what we would guess is stress. And when we released the animals, we transported them to the field location and it was a fine, beautiful uh, morning, uh, sun, not too many clouds in the sky. And by the time we released the frogs, uh, it was downpouring and the stream was flooded. So we think this may have had a pretty big impact on the dispersal of these animals. Um, so here's just a very simple map. Uh, we have the stream as this, this dotted blue line uh, and our transect. We had our stream transect through the middle, basically on the dotted blue line. And then outside the stream transect, we had terrestrial transects, uh, 10 meters on either side of the stream. And based on our previous reintroduction trial with Atlopus limosis, we thought this transect will give us the best possibility of redetecting re uh, these marking these frogs for this mark and recapture study because we we know with Atlopus limosis when we released them, they were 10 to 20 meters within the stream and they didn't move very far. And we decided this would probably be the best setup. Unfortunately, uh, just because of perhaps conditions, the stress of the animals, the heavy rain, uh, each of these different colored lines is a different animal. Uh, these, they, they seem to bolt as soon as they're released. Uh, so you can see traveling a couple hundred meters or so away from the stream. Uh, some of these ones up here uh, went up the hill and down the hill into the next stream. Um, so finding, finding these guys was a bit of a challenge and uh, it was very just unexpected based on our, our first reintroduction trial. And for our mark and recapture study, it was a bit of mixed results too. So we had 112 uh, recaptures for the frogs that were just not equipped with a radio transmitter, hard release frogs, 
And uh, most of those recaptures were within the first several days after release when there's a very high density of frogs along the stream. Um, and it, we, we recaptured 88 individuals. So um, most of the recaptures were just uh, recapturing a single individual once, which is, doesn't really tell you much about uh, long-term survival um, of your reintroduced frogs. And our last recapture was one month and four days after release. Uh, so we continued uh, these biweekly recapture, mark recapture surveys uh, for six months. And yeah, for about five months, we, we did not see any, any individuals, which is uh, a bit troubling because uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of animals used and we thought this was really gonna give us you know, better results. Um, two of the Allopes various were chytrid positive two weeks after release, uh, which was pretty quick. And something else that we learned during this reintroduction trial is that uh, understanding how BD prevalence in the community uh, shifts over the different seasons is probably very important. Um, so when we did uh, community surveys and swab animals just uh, a few days before release, uh, we, the prevalence in the community was about 44%, which is, you know, extremely high. Uh, like, you know, almost one in two of the animals that we found during these chytrid surveys was BD positive. Uh, so here you have some very susceptible animals going into this scenario where perhaps it's uh, peak BD conditions at this location. Um, so that really kind of made us think that, you know, here's, here's another challenge we really have to consider when doing these reintroductions is uh, not only is it good to know uh, BD prevalence at a site at the time of release, post release, but uh, having multiple years of data um, of BD prevalence throughout the seasons would be really ideal to figure out what's the best time to reintroduce these animals. Um, and here's a photo of uh, just uh, one of the thermal imaging cameras, um, which they, they work quite well. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to use while you're, you're doing this work. Um, just keeping the camera dry, uh, just the amount of time it took to turn on, turn off and take the photo. But uh, it would definitely be something that I think would be useful for future trials. So with this in mind, uh, we want to take the lessons that we <laughs> learned from this Allopus Lomosa, Allopus various reintroduction and apply it to one more reintroduction trial with Allopus Lomosis. Um, so we want to scale things back a bit. Uh, we decided that, you know, our mark recapture design did not work these first reintroduction trials and that was a uh, huge use of animals um, with Allopus various and uh, let's just not do the mark and recapture survey this time and try to figure out better methods to, to re-detect these animals. Um, so with this third reintroduction trial, we were wondering if there would be a difference in uh, perhaps like habitat and dispersal between two different sites. So we used the original, the site that we had used in the first at Lopez Lomos reintroduction trial. And this site had uh, just no real historical presence or knowledge of uh, Alopus Lomosis being there. Uh, the stream was very narrow. There wasn't really an open gap in the canopy. Uh, the vegetation was a bit different. Um, so we decided to use that the stream from the first trial. And there was another stream, just uh, a couple mile hike away up and down a, um, a ridge. And that stream has a remnant population of Allopus Um And we were just really curious about, you know, Perhaps these animals will disperse differently. Maybe predation will be different at this other site uh, where Allopus lomosis is occurring. And the frogs, 
the adult animals that we used were actually the same cohort of the animals in the first reintroduction trial. So they had mu grown much larger um, at this point. And we had males that were large enough to be equipped with a radio transmitter. So we decided that it'd be also interesting to see if there's any uh, difference in movement between the males and the females. Uh, so we were able to equip both sexes with uh, radio transmitters. And uh, we were also just really curious if, if you can use uh, soft release enclosures for a very you know, cost effective and cheap method for um, monitoring these animals post release. For example, the chytrid status, uh, weight of the animal, et cetera. And uh, it's quite a large uh, resource and time investment to use adult animals. So we're really curious of how reintroducing juvenile frogs would would work. So uh, we selected uh, quite a few juvenile animals to be reintroduced into mesocosms. Um, so at each site we had 14 frogs and we had 15 uh, soft release mesocosms at each site. And our results for this third trial were also um, a bit unexpected, I'd say. So uh, dispersal was a bit similar between both sites. Um, I would habitat usage at the site that had uh, has has a population of extent Alopis lamosis there. It was a bit different. Like these these frogs would hang out on the vegetation near the stream bank kind of like you'd expect the alopus to, um, and just, it it was just an, an observable difference. And, um, you know, the stream was a bit wider and a bit more proper habitat. So uh, it was just really interesting to, to see that. Um, <clears throat> we did learn also during this, this, trial that uh, the mesocosms are kind of like a double-edged sword, right? So they're very cheap, cost-effective, they're not super labor-intensive as you're not going out there radio tracking frogs, going through vegetation, um, but you know these are stationary mesocosms, trees can fall on them, uh, you know vegetation can fall on them, everything like that. Uh, they can just you gotta be careful where you place them. We never had one, any to get flooded, but uh, you also have to restore uh, leaf litter as in, a, in them as they decay. Um, and we actually had two snakes, the same species that ate a radio uh, transmitter frog earlier, the Eurythalampris, uh, break into the mesocosms and eat a couple of the frogs. So, you know, you have these mesocosms that you feel are pretty predator safe, but um, they're not really. And here's one of the snakes that was trying to escape the mesocosm. And uh, at the stream where the extent population of Alopus amosis lives, uh, our mesocosms there, uh, there is a couple of occasions where I was just monitoring the frogs, opening them up, um, getting ready to swab the frogs. And I noticed that these mesocosms were swar swarming with ants and the first time, you know, I had finished up swapping the frog, I put it back in the mesocosm and it, it dropped down from the leaf that was sleeping on and immediately the ants started biting it. So uh, I had to just, you know, take the, take, the ant, take the frog and release it away from its mesocosm. And that happened a second time too. So, you know, you have these stationary frogs that can not escape, um, you know, predators that can fit through the mesocosm like ants or snakes. So there is a problem there. The mesocosms do uh, provide a nice stationary point for, uh, you know, observing chytrid, um, though. And here's a little dendrobatic frog that was able to slip through um, the holes in the mesocosm. They're small enough, and sure enough, I bet this is how uh, a, a lot of the animals get, became BD positive while they were in the mesocosms. And we'd find uh, like little toadlets, Rabo hematidicus, and these gender bats quite often in the mesocosms. The mesocosms also present a challenge um, just locating the frogs in there, especially the juvenile animals. Uh, the juvenile animals were about one gram, 
and the adults were, you know, three and a half grams to 4.3 grams or so. And uh, searching for a one gram frog in these mesocosms was uh, extremely difficult. Um, me and my two assistants, we'd sift through the leaf litter probably for about 20 minutes, you know, clearing it all from one side back to the other. Uh, at the same time, you have to be very cautious because you have a small animal in there. And uh, there were several mesocosms that we just, we, we couldn't relocate the animal in, in the enclosure. And we repeatedly searched for it. And we just uh, kind of assumed that uh, something had predated upon it, uh, like ants or something like that. Um, but this was a, seemed to be the case for a few of the mesocosms. But at the end, we did end up locating like two of these juvenile frogs that we hadn't seen in weeks um, as we were clearing out the leaf litter and everything from these mesocosms. So the mesocosms are great, uh, but there, there are definitely some kinks that have to be worked out. And uh, there were a couple adult animals that did have some nose rubbing from the mesocosms. Um, so really figuring out the proper placement for these mesocosms so the animals aren't stressed out. Um, and I don't know if you could ever avoid the threat of predation for, for them in the rainforest. Uh, it's, it's something that definitely needs to be considered. And these are just lessons that we wouldn't have learned if we had never done these trials in the first place. Um, overall, I feel like, you know, it's still a viable option. We just have to figure out some solutions to these problems. Perhaps it's a different um, material that the mesocousins were made out of. Um, probably one of our greatest frustrations during this third trial is that uh, Luke mentioned earlier, you know, that the initial release point uh, and recording as much data as possible after that is, is really critical to figure out what happened to these frogs. And uh, we had some, some issues between uh, our radio receiver, the cables, uh, perhaps the antenna, or the radio transmitters themselves, or a combination of all these. And we actually lost a uh, signal on nine of the frogs within uh, the first week, uh, which really makes it difficult to compare or really determine what happened to these animals because uh, most of the, they weren't located again. Um, so that's one thing, uh, advice I have is that, you know, have a backup receiver, backup antennas. Uh, and if you're doing radio telemetry, multiple cables for sure, uh, just buy like a dozen of them. <laughs> and yeah, so conclusion, uh, release frogs are, are dying before chytrid fungus in many instances. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges that they face out there, predation threat and stuff like that, and uh, relocating these animals uh, in mark and recapture studies is very difficult without radio telemetry. Um, so it's, you know, but, I think a lot of us assume that these frogs would get chytrid, most of them, and uh, that would probably be the cause of death right away. And um, at least in our first reintroduction trial, that really didn't seem to be the case. Um, there's no way to mitigate chytrid in the environment, uh, but these uh, reintroduction trials are really critically important to uh, develop and improve methods for reintroduction of allopus, not only in Panama, but uh, in other range countries. I think identifying climatic refuges and understanding how resistance to chytrid is increasing in some of these allopus populations will be, you know, a critical direction for the future reintroductions. Um, the allopus at Lamosis at our field site seem to have pretty low BD loads in the wild. So, um, you know, determining what's going on there and if there's a possible to possible way to get that resistance into the captive population. It, some, some way to mitigate chytrid is probably going to be critical to establishing these populations in the long term. And I, I think the last bit of advice I have is uh, these reintroduction trials or reintroductions in general, they're, they're challenging and 
uh, try to prepare your team and the frogs as best as possible. And you, you can't you can't plan for everything uh, that will happen. And I look back on the three reintroduction trials, and I, I honestly think the the first one that we did was probably the one where we got the most uh, valuable information from. Uh, we had you know multiple frogs that had uh, we we had recaptures for for you know 25 to to 40 days after release with radio telemetry and that just wasn't the case during the second release trial and by the third and in the third release trial you know by by the end of it we had lost even more radio transmitter signals so um it, it's something that you know it takes repetition and you just gotta be aware that there's these pitfalls and you're gonna put a lot of money resources animals into these reintroduction trials and it's just part of the learning process and uh trying to replicate these reintroductions and um, have an adaptive management strategy. It's just, you know, something that's going to have to be done to make progress if you if you want to establish the species in the long term or at least supplement the, the population. And um, this is the, these lessons, uh, you know, when you're in the moment in the field, they, they can be pretty challenging for your team and sort of a morale killer. Uh, you know, our third reintroduction trial, I, I had a couple of veterans out with me that had been at a second reintroduction trial, and we, we were ready to go out there and find those frogs, and we were losing signals left and right. And, um, you know, these things you just can't prepare for, but you can't, you know, these, these small reintroduction trials with not so many animals, it's just a good way about going, going about it.